Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to IWA's Waterways webinar on managing non-native invasive species. Uh, today, we are looking to really find out and understand what are invasive species, uh, how to identify the impacts of invasive species, and to also understand the measures and methods to control them. So before then, a little bit more about myself. Uh, so I'm Alex Melson, the volunteer coordinator with the Inland Waterway Association. And I've been with the organisation for about four years, and four and a half years now, um, working primarily with Water Recovery Group. Um, since 2018, I have been um, working on the Restoration Hub to provide environmental advice to third party restoration groups and those involved with restoration. Before joining IWA, I spent some time with Groundwork South in Uxbridge, um, competing a lot of them, a number of community uh, projects in disadvantaged areas and managing nature reserves. So firstly, what are invasive species? So it's important to differentiate between non-native species and invasive non-native species. Uh, we'll start with non-native species first. Um, these are species that have been, been introduced by human action um, that occur outside the natural range of their, their, well, their prominence. Um, and such species can then sort of survive in this climate, climate and subsequently reproduce. Um, here we have a number of species um, that have been introduced through gardens, um, crops in farmland and, uh, and for, for hunting. Um, the main difference here is that invasive and non-native species, they have, are able to negatively impact our society, uh, whether that be economically, socially or environmentally, and are able to spread with quite, uh, in quite a voracious manner. Under the Wildlife and Countryside Act, year 1989, um, section 14 um, prohibits, uh, makes it illegal to release and allow the escape of any wild animal not ordinarily resident in the UK. And on schedule nine, you'll be able to find a, a whole list of plants and, and fauna um, that we uh, have classified this way. So here's a couple of examples um, of non-native species and invasive non-native species. So on the left, we have a number of species that have been brought over for, um, for, for, for produce, such as chickens, um, cow, cow, well, let's say cow and, uh, and pigs. These are all not native to Britain, but have been brought in over a number of years for that such reason. And we can also look at the same um, other species, such as potatoes, um, corn, and, and wheat, all again been introduced for to, to feed the population. Uh, these, so these species tend not to have uh, negative impacts and have the inability to really spread massively. Uh, the prime example here is um, chickens. Though they, may, 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 they, they are abundant across the nation, they don't tend to be able to survive very long outside of um, outside enclosures. There are also a number of non-native species that have become naturalized uh, over the number of uh, for past few centuries. Uh, these ones can include your horse chestnuts and your sycamores, which have been brought over by the Romans um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And in actual case, some of these species are now being looked at as a sort of a beneficial species. Um, in light of ash dieback and the reduction of ash trees across the country, um, we're expecting that the ecological niche that the, that the ash provides is looking to be sort of filled in a number of ways by sycamores and horse chestnuts. And on the right, we, may, we have our invasive non-native species. You, some of you may recognise these already. Um, so we have the zebra mussel, uh, the flow floating penny roll on the right. Uh, below that is Japanese knotweed, the grey squirrel and zander. And these are species that are able to really vigorously invade an area and cause massive damage. And I can't really move on without mentioning the, um, the, the line in between of species that some would consider non-native and others would consider invasive. The primary example of this is probably a buddleia. If, you're, uh, if you love butterflies, you will see buddleia as an amazing species uh, able to help local communities butterflies thrive. However, if you work on the railways, you will be more, more than aware that the um, species is a massive pest for them. 
So we're moving on to looking at the impact of invasive species. So the most commonly quoted impact is the sheer cost to the economy. So invasive non-native species, which is a mouthful to say, uh, costs Britain in the region of 1.7 billion pounds every year. And to put that in perspective, that's roughly the cost of 16 EU referendums. And um, what I'll be doing now is going into each in impact and sort of explaining how this cost is really, really uh, figured out. So firstly, we're going to look at the economic um, impacts. Again, this is the most commonly quoted through businesses, um, large and small, uh, alongside landowners and uh, navigation authorities. And the impacts for waterways can be quite, uh, quite hefty. So um, what I'll be doing is I'll quickly go through these points. Uh, so the removal costs of invasive species, um, CRT, Canal River Trust, spend about £700,000 each year just purely on treating invasives on navigable waterways. And this is your species like your floating pennywort, which a uh, floating pennywort, which can um, negate and impact navigation quite considerably. Um, so that's one of the bigger costs directly. Um, it also has, um, it's able to damage uh, heritage, heritage and structures. Uh, a number of species I may talk about today uh, are known to do so, but none, none more so commonly than the Japanese knotweed, knotweed which has the ability to really grow through, through structures. And finally, there's sort of delays to works. And um, this is a big issue for restoration societies. Um, or if you find invasive species on your site, you are inclined to have to remove them before you can start works, generally speaking. So a quick case study, where we're looking at Japanese knotweed. So each year, um, Japanese knotweed costs in the region of 165 million pounds to the UK economy. And this was taken back in 2010, so that number has almost certainly uh, jumped up in, re in recent years. Um, this species was introduced by the Victorians um, back in the 19th century to plant in ornamental gardens and had also been used to help stabilise the railway banks um, during those times as well. So with the cost to remove these species being about £5,600 to £11,000 per site, it becomes quite a hefty, uh, hefty problem to deal with um, for those organisations having to deal with it. Uh, the impact for these species is primarily, again, structural damage. So you've probably seen this, this species along the waterways or just growing up through car parks alongside buildings and in derelict land. And it's able to really damage um, how, how foundations of housing, roads, uh, etc. It is also known to reduce biodiversity in that it grows in massive clumps that can completely outshade anything in an area, so there will be no chance of your native flora to really thrive. And this species can really be, uh, can actually grow about one metre per month, and I think it goes to a maximum of about three or four metres um, in its prime. Um, in order to remove it from, from, from an area, you often have to involve um, chemical spraying or injecting into the stems or the physical removal and disposal um, of this and this is a species that does require it to be um, thoroughly removed in most cases you have to dig five meters deep in order to remove every last bit of root. It's also very important to remember to dispose of this properly as any single fragment of the plant can allow it to repropagate in a new area. So then we're going to move on to the environmental um, impacts and invasive species are often quoted as one of the single biggest uh, impactors of driving biodiversity to extinction across the globe and it's really put up there in the same, same lines with um, climate change and, and pollution events. So how does this uh, impact waterways? So it impacts protective species um, as it is again one of the single most damaging um, factors leading to the decline of biodiversity worldwide. If we just take our, um, our friend here, the water vole, on the left as a prime example, um, this species used to be pre pre um, prevalent back in, um, in the 1970s, um, but with the introduction of American mink and the loss of habitat from um, urbanisation and, env and environmental degradation, uh, we lost 90% of this species um, from to, well, to today. So how the American mink predates this species is when ordinarily your stoats and your native weasels wouldn't be able to get into the water vault burrows, 
um, the female American beings are small enough to actually be able to get in there. So there is almost no protection for, for water voles to avoid uh, predation, and this is why they've sort of they've been, or their numbers have been reduced so significantly. And this in turn really increased the costs to um, canal restoration groups and, and canal, canal groups in general to really protect these species and the cost um, associated, associated with it. Uh, another impact is on canal maintenance and uh, management. Uh, species such as your floating penny are able to restrict navigation as I mentioned previously and along with that it can also reduce biodiversity in those areas too. And finally, the last impact is the impact on the scenery, which is more of an intrinsic um, impact. But if we take a look at the waterways today to compared to 100 years ago, a lot of those natural views you may have seen in going across ancient woodlands have been severely detrimented through the inclusion of rhododendron or, or laurel. So here's a quick, quick case study on signal crayfish. So this species costs the UK £2.6 million each year and the impact costs come primarily from having to protect the native species of white clawed crayfish which are almost being driven to extinction in this country and having to really create arc sites in order to protect them. So in terms of, sort of direct damages, um, they are known to, this species is known to burrow into the sides of waterways and canals and it takes a lot of money to, to, to restore this. <clears throat> so other impacts include the uh, reduction of biodiversity and fishing stocks, because this species is well known to uh, predate on the eggs of fish and also can actually physically take them out as they're, they're, they're swimming past. And the, riparian, and the riparian buffers, which one example here um, includes the, uh, the River Lambourne, in which it cost uh, £105,000 in order to restore just an 800 metre stretch. Uh, in order to, to restore the whole three kilometres they wish to do, uh, it would have been along the lines of £1.1 million to, uh, to fully restore. So next we're going to move on to the social uh, impacts of invasive species. So they can also affect the way we live from damaging our health to increasing the risk of natural disasters. And here the most um, commonly quoted uh, invasive species on this matter uh, is the uh, giant's hogweed, which I believe you've seen the articles in newspapers recently, which if you get a sap onto your skin and it's exposed to UV, UV light, it can cause massive blisters. Um, and this is quite a, 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 quite a large spread on the, um, in the waterways. So if you go diet, delve into a few more of the direct impacts. So one of the more direct impacts is the uh, increased flood risk you get from uh, invasive species taking control of, uh, of an area. But here again, I'm going to talk about a um, floating penny wart, where it flows in such large carpets and mats, it can actually restrict the flow of water during large uh, rainfall events. And in that case, you can, get, you can often find localised flooding in that region. Now, I've already mentioned reduced navigation, so I won't go into too much detail here. Uh, not, not so much a direct impact, but there, are, there is a possibility for insurance claims against your, uh, an organisation or restoration group um, if they've been found to not be dealing with invasive species on, on their land and allowing them to, uh, to spread. And finally, there's also the um, poor reputation you can receive locally if um, your local stakeholders are aware that you're allowing the spread of species and not really dealing with them in a, in a timely manner. So we've already, I've already mentioned this species, the floating penny wall. Um, again, this is a cost taken back in 2010, um, but it's estimated to cost 25 million pounds each year to, to deal with, with this species, costing up to 1,800 to 2,000 pounds uh, per kilometre. And this is often, often used through um, physical removal, um, using, uh, yeah, physical removal and uh, chemical spraying um, in during the right times of the year. So this species can spread about 20 centimetres per day in, in the height of summer. And I'm sure most of you have seen them sort of verging on the sides of uh, the riparian areas of your waterways, uh, in ditches and um, all, all, over the, all, all over our waterways. So I'm going to quickly move on to um, how we can really control invasive species. So there are four primary control measures to really managing and dealing with invasive species. 
Um, you can get in there and physically remove them and dispose of, dispose of them using manual labour, machines, um, cutting or trapping. And here this can often involve volunteers or professionals um, to, to deal with the species. Uh, next we have chemical control methods which is applying chemicals and herbicides, uh, injecting species and, um, and spraying them along edges. Here we're looking at just trying to reduce the vigour of these species. Uh, you've got biological control measures which are usually not uh, are usually reserved for the most um, difficult cases um, and has negative can have both positive and negative effects i'll quickly provide a couple of examples so one positive effect of control of biological control measures is in scotland where they have been encouraging um pine martins and reintroducing them to areas within the um within national forests uh, what was the, discovered is that the Pine martin is much more successful at hunting the grey squirrel um, due to its size and its speed being much slower than red. And that's actually been able to encourage your local red, red squirrels to, to really bounce back in those areas. Um, there's that. Uh, an example of where it's gone horribly wrong, however, is if we look at Hawaii back in the 1970s, um, after the black rats managed to really invade young islands they identified that they were hunting down and killing the bird nests and bird species along with turtles and turtle eggs. To combat this they introduced a species called the small Asian mongoose um, which was released all over Hawaii. However they what they failed to realize is that the small Asian mongoose is uh, hunted during the day while the black rat was nocturnal so these two species almost completely missed each other and both ended up hunting and predating the uh, birds and turtles. So the, the problem had been uh, exacerbated. And then finally, there's the prevention methods. This is essentially trying to avoid invasive species from spreading any further than they already have. And this is through successful site management, educating the local population or your workforce, and trying to really alter behaviours um, when working near species. Everybody's just going forward. There we go. So, how can you on the waterways really help control invasive species? Uh, well, firstly, it's really important to identify what species you might come across, um, and you can all, you can find this information out on the um, NNSS, which is the Non-Native Species Secretariat. Um, they have over 50 toolbox talks on how to identify a number of, of invasive species, and you can also head to the IWA website. Um, we have a section on the more common ones found along our waterways. Um, but by, by, by um, familiarising yourself with these species, you can then move on to report them to your local navigation authority or your land managers. Um, here we can really work out the problem and the extent. Even small infestations can eventually become massive problems. Through early reporting, you can really help the um, management authorities remove them before it, become, it becomes that, that big, big issue. Um, failing that, you can also report it nationally or nationwide using the NBN Gateway or iRecord, in which they use that information to really inform government about how much the problem has, has spread in, in, over, over the years. Sec uh, finally, there's also you want to prevent the species from spreading. So if you're using the waterways, whether you're fishing, kayaking, canoeing, um, you can really help help avoid this through the um, y, y, RYA's uh, Check Clean Dry campaign, which more or less is a case of checking your equipment before you're moving on to another waterway, uh, cleaning your, your gear or disinfecting your boots, and finally allowing them to dry and to finally kill off anything that might be um, you're holding on. And finally, there's the um, remove it. If you come across it and you're able to remove it, um, please do so. As long as you can dispose of it in the, the proper proper manner, it's it all it all helps. So I'm going to discuss an example of how volunteers can be involved in moving invasives um, through IWA's uh, Paul Snap Stomp campaign and uh, Himalayan balsam. So Himalayan balsam is an invasive species that was introduced again during the Victorian times um, and can grow as a massive plant that can grow up to heights of three meters. The issue with this plant is that it can produce up to 800 seeds per individual plant and they are able to, um, if interrupted, they have a, an explosive mechanism to spread up to three metres uh, away. Um, 
over the last 15 years, these species of this species has really um, boomed on the waterways, and you're probably almost guaranteed to, guaranteed to find it anywhere you go. Uh, IWA volunteers have been involved since um, 2000, I believe, even since before 2015, in which um, we've been encouraging work parties and volunteers to really get in there and, and remove the problem. Um, so this is where our pull snap start campaign comes in. Um, so we ask volunteers out on their walks and um, work parties to essentially pull the Himalayan balsam, which comes up very easily due to its shallow root system. Uh, this is because of it's it's um beginnings in the himalayas where there's not much soil and it's mostly trying to get into cracks and and, and um crevices along waterways so they pull up very easily and what you don't want to do is to snap the stem below the lowest node um which is these little bulges you can see on the left hand side of the image um with our volunteer those are on it um, you want to basically rip the root off from that um from that lowest node and then you want to take a part, make a pile of your of the um, Himalayan balsam, and really sort of stamp it down to encourage the rotting process and to avoid it from spreading any further. Here, it's important to remember that actually, you have to pick it at the right time, um, usually between June and July, or you run the risk of actually causing a bigger problem as you pull the, as you pull the um, plant up. The seeds will start to disperse. Um, which can become kind of a massive, massive problem. And when it, when it gets in the water, it ends up going downstream, of course. So what is, a, what is best practice in the management of invasive species? So this is more or less aimed at those undertaking work parties on, on your waterways or your canal restoration groups. So before starting any work, it's best to really review what is in the area you're going to be working with and you can often find this information by completing site surveys doing a quick um, site visit or contacting your local biodiversity record centers and they're able to tell you exactly what you might come and find then you'd like to have to start really liaising with your your site owner and here you'll be looking at statutory bodies that have been identified and you can start thinking about what are the appropriate control measures to deal with individual species because not, not all of them will be done in, in the same manner. And then you want to start considering how you would segregate these species and keep your, keep your volunteers um, away from them. It can almost be as simple as creating no-go zones or fencing off certain areas. During works, once you begin work parties or working with volunteers, um, it's really important to, re to brief um, who will be working in and what, and what species are present and where you want to go and where you want to avoid. Um, for, for being able to identify these species, what, um, volunteers can take, take, take actions to really reduce the spread. You don't want to look at uh, ensuring planning permission is um, perceived to, to control the species. Uh, for example, if you have Japanese knotweed, uh, a lot of the time, volunteers won't have the, the correct qualifications to um, to manage them effectively, and can be end causing more more of an issue. So you also want to biosecure the area. So biosecurity is essentially putting in place measures to avoid the spread um, on a site. So here we want to look at sort of disinfecting um, your equipment, tools, boots, and PPE, as well as putting up signs. Um, to sort of warn, warn volunteers and, and, uh, and local people what species are present. And then finally is looking at the appropriate disposal measure for these native uh, inv non-native invasive species. Uh, afterwards, it's important to report the work you have done, um, looking at how much you've removed and what you have found, as well as encouraging people to report what they find going forward. Um, in order to keep the keep the spread down, uh, you also want to continue to manage um, the site. So every so often, you want to go back in and help clear the um, clear the invasive species if you can, and um, reduce it on your site. And then finally, sort of educating the public in what's what's here again. So a couple of do's and don'ts with um, invasive species. So I was going to list for a couple of do's first. So you do want to record and report invasive species when and if you find them and encourage everyone on site to do, to do so. Secondly, you want to budget in for the removal and management costs um, for removing, keeping, species, keeping invasive species down. And you'd also want to incorporate this into your project plans um, and risk assessments. 
what you really want to avoid doing to um, avoid any impacts or negative press later on is to ignore or allow or ignore and allow the invasive species to uh, to spread to assume it's somebody else's problem if you live if you're working on a boundary between site it's important to again report what you find it may not be on your land but the council can potentially support you in um, getting that removed before it gets, it gets onto your land and also don't uh, also avoid managing in not uh, managing non-native invasive species without the right qualifications um, or protections so here's a couple of useful resources um, that can be used on, on your sites um, or when you're out and about. Uh, I'll, share, I'll share this around later if you wish. And um, thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I can't answer the question, I'll get back to you as soon as I can um, with a more, more detailed uh, answer. Okay, well, thank you very much to Alex for that talk, which I think is really rather comprehensive and tells us all sorts of things about invasive species. We didn't know. Um, as I say before, now is the time to ask your questions. Um, for most people um, on a PC, the uh, Q&A button will be towards the bottom of your screen. Although if you've got an iPad or some other devices, it may be elsewhere, maybe top of your screen. You should see a little button with the words Q and A. Just type in your questions there and we'll see what they are and we'll, we'll um, ask Alex the questions. Um, we've had one question come through so far, um, oh, there's more coming through. Uh, the first question is to Alex, how do you report sightings of invasive species? And perhaps not only could you tell us how, but could you tell us who you should report them to? Right, so there's a number of areas in which you can report invasive species. Um, the, it primarily depends on whereabouts you are in the country. Um, if you're walking on a waterway, uh, your first port of call would be the local navigation authority. So whether that's the Canal Trust or any other smaller groups, um, you report them, reported them um, using as much detail as you can, whether that's going to be um, sort of landmarks, uh, OS coordinates, uh, do take pictures. Um, so that's them. Um, potentially, if you can't get hold of your local authority, you report it to your local council. They often have an environmental, um, an environmental health officer whose responsibility is to record and um, assess invasive species in different areas. Okay, um, thank you. The, the next question we've got is, can you tell us which invasive species you think is the, the most troublesome for nav navigable waterways? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, they all got, they've all got different impacts in which they can really um, detriment, be a detriment to different areas. But for me, I'd say, the most problematic in terms of an all-rounder is probably your floating penny wart, um, where it reduces navigation, it damages biodiversity, and it can also um, also increase increase flood risk. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we've been asked is: Are there any invasive species that have been successfully eradicated, either uh, perhaps good. in local areas or the whole country? That's, that, that is a good question. Um, my favourite example here is uh, on the Isle of Wight, in which they've managed to keep the grey squirrel population to, uh, to a zero after it, once did, it did once invade, invade. Um, but that's through a, lot, a large volunteer force actually hunting these species, um, species down. Uh, it gets a lot more difficult um, with your species that can spread like Himalayan and balsam, your, your Japanese knotweed, um, as a lot of people and animals will often turn a blind eye um, to noticing them due to the costs that can be associated in the, in the, in the short term. Um, so to, I guess to answer that question, I have to take a little bit, bit, a bit more of a look into this. Um, but as far as I'm aware of, it's uh, not many invasive species have really been uh, eradicated from the country. Okay, another question that came through almost at the same, same time, which is very similar, but a little bit of a bent to it, it says, is there any realistic prospect of an invasive species being eradicated from our environment? And has this been achieved elsewhere? Oh, is this the same question? <laughs> it's almost the same question, but not quite. So um, <laughs> you, you mentioned the, the, the squirrels on the Isle of Wight. Is there, I mean, things like Japanese knotweed and floating penny work, what, what's the prospects of getting rid of something that's pr pretty well uh, established throughout the whole country? Is that going to be possible or are we going to end up living with these invasive species forever. Perhaps uh, something else to be the new normal. 
Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist in these manners. I think it's not entirely possible to completely eradicate these species from the whole country. You can remove local infestations um, almost certainly, and you can almost certainly remove them from waterways and ditches locally. Um, but in terms of um, trying to eradicate them, I think the point is now looking at trying to reduce the spread and um, really trying to try and stop the impact um, everywhere. So it's easier to keep them from invading a new area than it is to remove them everywhere. So it's really to protect the areas that we have got left that are, are invasive free. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, are there, oh, sorry, are the waterways considered a risk factor in the spreading of invasives? Um, as so many use the channels to spread, you know, such as mink and uh, um, if so, is there any particular good practice advice to uh, help control that thing, sort of thing? Yes, yeah, so um, the waterways are a massive uh, vector for the spread of invasive species, um, especially in the likes of himalayan and balsam, um, Japanese knotweed and um, other species that spread via sort of seed. Um, the real big struggle for us is during your localised water, um, sorry, localised flooding events, where you can clear a whole section, um, but if an area has left, say, about a kilometre downstream um, or on a ditch to the side of your side of your waterway that just again allows the seeds to redistribute themselves on the banks and get back into that source so they are a massive massive um, risk vector and in terms of um what was the last part of the question <laughs> sorry what was the last part of the question there well it's really whether the waterways are, are a risk factor and what you can do about it what oh yes uh, what you can do about it there are a number of ways to really reduce this risk um that really does um, can depend on whether you organise get work, organise work parties get or get involved with them, or even if you spend five minutes on your walk um, or, or boating on your canal just to remove some as you come across it. Um, and him and balsam is a very easy one to do this for, as long as it's not after August in which the seeds will spread that horribly. Yes, and I think you mentioned earlier in your talk very briefly that if you're like a canoeist or you're using equipment in the waterways, it's important to clean clean the equipment up, clean your canoes, clean boots and that, so you don't go to one waterway, take the invasive species and spread it somewhere else. That's right, so yeah, if possible, it's always good to, to sort of check your engine water for all invasive species or your propellers as well. Um, and if you happen to be in a lock, before you enter a lock, if you can, scoop it out and leave it onto the side and hopefully it can sort of help reduce the spread again. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about Japanese knotweed. Um, and it's, uh, the question is, are you required to have specific qualifications to spray and to deal with Japanese knotweed uh, and other, you know, any other invasive species? Because um, you might be using some dangerous chemicals. So what's the position there? Yes, yeah, so um, a number of invasive species, as Tim mentions, um, such as Japanese knotweeds and your giant hogsweed, they, they do require um, specialist um, training and qualifications to, to manage them effectively. Um, it usually involves the application of chemical chemicals and herbicides or, or injections um, so it's all about getting the right mix to also not damage the environment locally as well and there's also another level of complexity of when you're spraying and using chemicals near waterways so there's a number of courses much like when you're going for a chainsaw um, a ch chainsaw qualification there's a number of steps and that those steps will then allow you to take on more and more um, damaging or invasive species Okay, so are there any others to mention apart from Japanese knotweed and giant hogweed that you people have got to be yes. very careful of? Yeah, so people can also be careful of, um, you can also chemically treat floating pennywort, but again that's best left to the navigation authorities to deal with, as the wrong mix can really lead to a massive ecological um, disaster. Um, but those are the two big ones that, that do require qualifications. Other ones such as floating pennywort, himalayan balsam, um, New Zealand pygmy wart, etc. Do require, um, don't have to require a license, um, but you are, oh sorry, that, that reminds me, you do need a license to deal with um, crayfish as well, um, so that's your, your signal crayfish and your, um, oh I forget its name, I'll, I'll come back to this, there's, there's another one that's uh, problematic. Okay, um, I'll back to that one. thank you. There's another question on almost the same subject but a little bit specialised and the questioner is asking whether there's any advice on spraying control of giant hogweed as against physical cutting it, which you know, which is best, and also um, 
if you're using weevils to control a zola, um, do, do you know if they'll overwinter successfully or not? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer the first one, uh, first question first. Um, in terms of advice on spraying giant hogweeds versus physical kine, uh, I, I believe a lot of companies prefer to um, chemically treat the plant um, in order to reduce the risk of coming into contact for, for workers. Um, but often enough, you'll see these guys uh, or girls wearing big over uh, or wearing overalls and face masks to really limit the contact. Um, so I believe the primary primarily are looking at um, spray um, spraying for giant hogsweed. And in terms of weevils for Azola, I'm actually going to have to take a, a look into that. One. I don't really know too much about that, but if you drop it, drop us an email. I can take a quick look into that for you. Thank you. Um, the next question is saying. Um, it's unlikely that the general public, especially with small children, know the danger of picking the pretty pink flowers on the towpath, such as Japanese knotweed or uh, um, you know, there may be others. Do you think there are any invasive species that Canal River Trust or indeed other navigation authorities or other landowners should be posting warning signs about? Uh, or would absolutely. that be overkill? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think a, a, a picture tells a, um, says a million words. Well, it's better. I'm just saying that's terrible. <laughs> but yes, almost certainly having a, a poster available to really explain what the species is, how to identify it, and why you shouldn't touch it or, or do anything about it or go near it, um, really that does go a long way in preventing the spread. Because um, unfortunately, Japanese, Japanese knotweed is a very lovely looking plant. Um, so yes, I, I would always recommend potentially getting in touch with your local navigation authority or if you're in the land, just put up a a couple of signs where there might be invasive species present to try and, I guess, lessen the impact from those who don't quite know so much. Okay. Another question, or almost a comment, says, um, it's almost a similar subject. It says the lady um, is asking the question, lives in Scotland and only came across American pennywort when she was boating on the Grand Union Canal last summer. Um, she came across information boards that said it was in the southeast of England. Um, uh, and on, I'm not, she's noticed that on Robbie Cummings' canal boat diaries that he fished out from his weed hatch uh, what looked like Pennywort near Manchester. Um, so you know, do you think this sort of uh, shows the need for, for greater awareness of these issues? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Um, we really need to sort of focus on national, a national approach to identifying and dealing with these species. Um, but no, you're right. It does, there are massive gaps in the mapping across the country in terms of where they've been recorded um, as such. And because they can literally spread like that and people still plant them in their ponds, and in their, in their ponds the ability for them to escape is also quite high. So um, my advice to anyone working in that, in that with, with what they think might be an invasive species is to take a picture of it and then they can forward it on to myself or I can pass it on to a uh, number of other experts who can identify that for you and then we can look at informing the local authorities and or looking at informing the informing everyone at, at national national level okay um comment here it's not so much a question but just some uh contribution um caller says that new zealand has been very successful in reducing the number of invasive species and has a big program of spraying and trapping um, they've obviously put a lot of government money into it. So do you think there's something that this government should be doing? Is there an economic argument for it? Or is it oh. just for the benefit of wildlife and biodiversity? Or, or what do you think, you know, what do you think government's responsibilities are here compared to what the uh, responsibilities of individual landowners are? Yeah, so only, I personally believe governments should take a much more active role in the um, management of invasive species. I don't know if anyone's seen recently in newspapers that there were um, there were calls for those on the who've been furloughed to get involved in the management of, of a number of these species. Um, I believe the, the big issue um, for this country is um, we've been having invasive species for quite a fair few centuries now, um, and the policies don't quite match up to the same standard as that of New Zealand or say Australia at, at this point. Um, and their checks might be a bit, bit more hefty. One of the um, bigger ways, one of the more common ways that invasives get into our country is through the, um, uh, pl the plant trade um, for gardens and plants. Um, and it's when people sort of move in out of their gardens and then they can introduce them to completely new areas. Um, but I almost certainly believe there's more government and uh, 
and landowners land can do to really help eradicate it or, or reduce the problem. Okay, um, just going back to a question that was asked a, a few moments ago, um, just a point of clarification. We were talking about um, drawing attention and education for these uh, um, invasive species and we were saying whether Canal and River Trust, for example, had a duty to do some education. Is this something that IWA has done any lobbying on or should be doing lobbying on, do you think? Or what do you think IWA's role is or, or WORG's role or, um, or that of individual waterway societies? Do you think we have a duty there or is this really so, something that's outside our remit? How would, how would you say it fits in IWA's priorities? I'd say it could be potentially quite, quite a high priority, but as, as we all know, it's quite a difficult topic to manage um, because we don't, besides the Chairman Blackwater navigation, we don't really have direct control over a number of waterways. So where, where I believe we fit in is the, uh, the education and campaigning to really uh, improve how invasive species are managed across the waterways. Um, so it's through offering advice um, and support to, to groups that do want to, to get involved locally. Um, that's where I think we really do fit in. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about mink and the question would like to say, what's the current situation with mink? Has there been any decrease in numbers? Um, the question says he once saw dogs swimming in the Macclesfield Canal, which was, uh, which were being used to hunt them. And do you know if that's an effective method? Yes, so again, this, um, for, for the American mink, it's very much um, locally and regionally how, how well they are, they are managed. Uh, I, know, I know Essex has got, have got a very, good ca um, a very good campaign at the moment, which they're encouraging water voles, and as a result, they've got volunteers who've been trained to capture and, and kill mink that, um, on waterways. Um, but it all very much depends regionally. I think numbers are either stabilising and decreasing, but that could very much be different in different regions. Um, and so I believe that dogs have been used in the past, but the preferred method these days is to mainly kill them through trapping and, uh, and, using, a, and using a gun. Okay, um, next question is about uh, water, water hemlock dropwort and asking whether that's a problem for the waterways. That's water hemlock dropwort. Yes, yes, water hemlock dropwort is one of those uh, interesting species where I don't believe it's technically an invasive species as opposed to one um, that's native to UK, but I think as a native invasive species, if that makes any sense. So um, that's a plant that is often more associated as, a, as an injurious plant that has the potential to really harm people and it can spread quite rapidly, but it doesn't tend to get the same, um, the same scrutiny or publicity as the other bigger ones. Um, I can take a little bit more look into it. Um, it's a species, I'm not, an area that I'm not too well, well informed about, and I can get back to you with that one. Okay. Um, the next question is, who in the UK has overall responsibility for invasive species? Is it something that government has a responsibility for? Is there a particular government department? Is it down to county wildlife trusts? You know, who, who's, who's really accountable for it? So it's really interesting in that um, it seems to be almost everyone's accountable for it at different levels and depending on where you find it. Um, and this is why a lot of people will either close their eyes or pretend they haven't seen the species. Um, for example, it depends on where you find it. If it's found on council land, it becomes a council problem. If it's found on private land, it's a private problem. If it's found on waterways, it becomes a, a navigation authority's problem. Um, so there's not really much consistency or, or lead on this. There's a couple of organisations such as the Non-Native Species Secretariat, which again, they advise and give alerts out on a number of invasives, but that's, that's all they, they can really, really achieve. Uh, I believe Scotland and Wales do have a, a stronger programme of eradication than we do in, the, in, in England. Um, but really what it's all about is putting pressure on those who have to manage it or those whose land it is to really deal with the species as it comes up. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can you just explain in general terms, what is meant by biosecurity? I know you covered it slightly earlier on in the presentation, but perhaps you can just give us a, a summary of what is really meant by that. Yes, so, so essentially biosecurity is about the prevention of organisms, um, both large and small, from being able to spread outside an area. So it's putting in measures um, such as your check, clean, dry campaign, um, but more, but more interestingly, on like restoration sites, it'd be a case of washing down wheels of your vehicles going in and out of areas with invasives, 
um, putting disinfection spots in here, um, putting up signs and putting up areas and fencing off. So it's basically about ensuring that whatever you have that's invasive or, or a threat um, to, the, to the local society or society as a whole is restricted and, and removed. Okay. Um, next question is really another one on involving waterways restoration. And it's for what waterway restoration groups, should they be undertaking the survey of their sites to see what invasive species are there before they start any other work? Yes, almost certainly. Um, by walking the waterways at different times of the year, you can really see what invasives you'll be potentially coming up to in say year five, six, 10, 20 of your, of your restoration plan. Um, by allowing them to, to stay put and not really dealing with them, that can almost certainly negatively impact you down the line, whether it's through increased costs or, um, or poor, again, or poor reputation. So I would almost certainly encourage um, groups to really get out there and look at, at invasives. Um, and I'll be more than happy to also help to confirm, confirm suspicions of invasive species and on occasion help to sort of survey the sites if, if that's wished as well. Okay. Apart from sending in details to yourself, is there a good reference um, that you'd recommend sort of a website or other source where people can find out more about different invasive species? Um, yes. Because as has been mentioned earlier, uh, not everyone will know all the species and all those that are harmful and those that can perhaps be tolerated. Right, well, funny enough, what I will do is I'm happy to point people to the um, to our website on the IWA. We have a whole section on um, your common waterway species of invasives. Um, but if you're looking at a more of a detailed view and getting um, individual toolbox, toolbox talks off, I would almost certainly recommend the uh, Non-Native Species Secretariat or NNSS. Um, they have over 50 toolbox talks available on a number of species affecting um, the whole country. So they're probably the main source of information I would recommend. Okay. Um, the next question is about Japanese knotweed, but this uh, might extend to other uh, invasive species. And the question is asking, um, well, the question is telling us that Japanese knotweed is edible. Um, uh, are there any other known invasive species that are, are edible, apart from perhaps grey squirrels? Well, besides grey squirrels and, uh, and signal crayfish, <laughs> uh, actually, um, human and balsam is an, is an edible plant. Uh, the petals themselves can be can be used to eat directly, or you can actually um, distill them to make wine. Which again, I believe is an amazing blog written by our own Alison Smedley, who who had produced um, a batch of Himalayan balsam wine. And uh, I am also aware in Hertfordshire, the local wildlife trust has produced a Himalayan balsam gin. So there are a number of invasives that can be um, can be uh, safely eaten, just not giant hogweed. If um... If restoration groups are looking for help with uh, dealing with invasive species, are their local wildlife trusts a good uh, source of information and help? Yes, the local wildlife trust, especially if your site runs alongside or near theirs, um, they will be very much be quite ha happy to um, to support any any work. Um, but equally enough, they also often will ho host the um, biodiversity record centre locally. Um, and often you'll find that the individuals who work there are also equally happy to, to get involved in reporting and, uh, and dealing with invasive species. Okay, uh, the next question is, are you able to give advice on biodiversity issues for uh, new waterway projects? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm always more than happy to offer advice. Um, this things into something that's coming up soon in the future, not so much directed at invasive species, but more about biodiversity net gain, which we'll be having a webinar on uh, next month. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to help support biodiversity issues and try and help work ways around them and put in management plans to really benefit any restoration projects or waterway projects. Okay, the next question is, do you think it would be appropriate to hold or for work to host some uh, canal camps specifically to deal with um, invasive species, um, including those on navigable waterways rather than uh, you, the usual sort of building work? Of course, yeah, I mean, as long as the work's there, I mean, we're usually quite keen to get out there, whether it's um, on a canal camp or, or a regional dig, um, as long as there's enough to, to really keep everyone busy and, and make it well for an event, it's something we can definitely get, get involved with. Okay, thank you. Now then, we've just got about five more minutes left, so if there are any final questions that people have, um, please pop them through. I think this has been 
tremendous uh, session for lots of questions has kept Alex on his toes. Um, the next question that Alex comes through is, um, can Alex tell him, tell us um, what his favourite invasive species is to deal with? Are there any particular enjoyable <laughs> ones that, uh, whether it's Himalayan balsam bashing or uh, running after mink or, or whatever else? I mean, I, I'm, I personally absolutely, absolutely hate grey squirrels, but I said I wouldn't mention that, um, but I had to get in somewhere. Uh, but for me, it's got to be the Himalayan balsam. Um, when you put it and snap it, it makes the most satisfying crunch. And it, you can really achieve a lot of, um, well, you can actually achieve a, a massive eradication program in just, just a single day. You just keep pulling and, uh, and snapping. It's one of those ones that are really, e I say, quite easy to deal with um, if you're on your own or with a group. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, are there any funding sources available to help control invasive species? Yeah, so usually you can often get um, get funding. It's hard, I think it's quite hard to get them directly um, funding the, the, the eradication programs, um, but you can of, o, often tie them in with other works. So if you're part of a restoration group, if you've got a big a big fund going through, don't be scared to add a set a bit in for the control of invasive species. Um, a lot of fundraisers currently, well before COVID-19, were really looking at making the environment the forefront of, um, of a bid. So if you can well, pick, pick together a big package of um, environmental issues alongside um, your restoration projects, that can really help with any, any, any projects, I think. Okay, now the next question is a really topical one, and it's saying, is there any chance of socially distant work parties for Himalayan balsam bashing? Yeah, yeah, so human balsam doesn't really require you to um, be in a, in, a clo in a closed area or with a group um, less than two metres away. Um, what, what we often recommend is you can currently go along with the waterways of your family or your one other person and pick it up if you're on a towpath. Or if you can get into a, an area it's safe to do so, you can always sort of spread out and collect piles. Uh, my suggestion here is um, if you've got any kids with you in this to, to do to do this, um, make it a bit of a competition for who can collect the, either the largest Tim and Balsam or, um, or or create a big, the biggest pile or such. Okay. Um, the next question is presumably, or maybe there aren't, are there any additional considerations for dealing with invasive species removal in areas that are triple SIs? Yes, yes. So with triple SIs, um, by, by law, the land managers or, or um, authorities who, who work on them have to keep the triple SIs um, in a good condition or from or at least having it, avoid having the condition fall. Uh, invasive species are one of the quickest ways for your triple SI to go from good or pristine to terrible and, um, and, and rubbish. So usually there's, there's a lot of, always lots of works on triple SIs to reduce the spread of invasive species. Okay, the, the next question is, there's two parts to this question. First of all, which invasive species do you think has been the most damaging in the United Kingdom? And which one do you think will be the most damaging in the future? Oh, good question. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, if you're looking at just, I'd say from a completely economic point of view, I would say the most damaging has to be Japanese knotweed, and it's probably the most well known. Um, but for me, I would be inclined to actually say uh, the grey squirrel, because um, its, it's impact on the, on the red squirrel population has been quite substantial over the, uh, over the years. And the second question was, which one will become the biggest issue? Um, for me, I believe it's the, or it's already a massive issue currently, it's a species called the ash emerald boar beetle, or the emerald boar beetle, which was native to Asia. And alongside ash dieback, these species are targeting um, ash trees and reducing their, um, their ability to, to survive beyond, uh, say, five, ten years of, of maturity. So I think that's the one to be really watching out for, is the yeah, emerald ash borer. Okay, now we're almost out of time, but just um, to give Alex one final uh, opportunity. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about invasive species that you haven't said so far? Any final words for us? Or, I mean, in terms of final words, maybe not so much, not so much final words as opposed to, to more of a, a plea is to really sort of get out there and sort of identify, ident learn to identify what these species are and, and just really report them. That's the best thing that you can currently do is to just report it on a, on a national scale. Okay. Well, thank you very much to Alex and to all our uh, attendees today and for all the questions. The final comment uh, that's in is from one of our listeners who said it really has been a superb 
presentation and you really do know your topic, which I can only endorse. So thank you very much, Alex. I think that's brilliant. Uh, and thank thanks everyone for tuning in. I hope you've uh, been educated and enjoyed this and found this a useful session. And we hope we'll see you at the, at the next session. As you know, we've uh, got seminars lined up for the next few weeks, uh, usually on Tuesdays and occasionally other dates. And there are also occasional branch seminars. So lot, lots to see and lots to learn. So thank you very much and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.